Welcome to the Church Front Podcast, where we help you lead gospel-centered and text-heavy worship. And in today's episode, we're here with the Church Front crew, some of us. It's great to be here, Luke. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you made the long trek from the desk to the table. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Thank you for your sacrifice for the episode. Yeah, you're welcome. My desk is even further. That's true. That's true. Uh, so we have Jake here with Church Front and, uh, and Adam. Yeah. Thanks for hopping on. Yeah. I'm excited about the podcast this year. Yeah. Same, same. We, we've done a lot of, you know, podcast content over the past couple of years, and some of it has been music related. Some of it's been book reviews. Some of it's been just us, you know, round tabling certain things. And I think this year we really want to, you know, continue to just bring good content and um, just stuff that would help leaders in the church, you know, people who are serving as a, a tech leader or worship pastor and staff, volunteer, part-time, full-time, whatever it might be. We hope to bring resources discussions, mindset shifts that might help uh, those in those roles. So yeah. I'm excited about it. Let's do it. Well, today we're going to kick off kind of a, a couple episode mini series, if you will, but we're just going to try to give you a couple episodes of really specifically, we're going to talk about leadership and, and what that looks like for specifically those roles in worship leadership, tech leadership, those roles that you would find in church in the worship ministry uh, department. And and we're, we're just going to kind of break it down. Hopefully this is practical, but it might be a little bit more mindset related. So um, yeah, maybe a couple questions to start us off. I mean, um, let's start with you, Adam. Why don't you tell kind of the listeners, viewers, what what your role was before coming to church front? Because you were in a church on staff, right? Yep. So what was that part-time, full-time? What was your role, job description, that kind of thing? Yeah, it's probably what most, a lot of people are experiencing is like full-time role at a normal-sized church, you know, like two to 400 people where the worship pastor is the, you know, full-time paid staff position that's also in charge of tech, some communications, like just other random things that kind of get tacked on. But like the main part of the role is leading worship. So it's basically you're the person on stage every Sunday, except for maybe twice a year, and then you are in charge of all the technology as well. Yeah, yeah. And you were, the, how long were you at that church? Uh, that was uh, two or three years. Okay. Yeah, just a few years. And then Jake, why don't you feel, for those listeners and people who might not know you and your mm-hmm. background, what, what role were you in in the church before Church Front? I mean, if there was yeah, a before, before church, front. church Front. Yeah, there was. You know, I led my, you know, I was in seminary, leading part-time at church as worship leader role. And then after seminary, had about a year. Actually, no, it was, I was like the last year of seminary, I was full time at a church worship worship leader for the contemporary service, communications kind of director role, because more more just because I was the only person who would actually do any yeah. communications work because uh, I cared about website and stuff yeah. like that. This was back in 2015, 2016. And then a month after seminary was when I quit my full time church job. Wow. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Well, my, my question for you guys, um, and, and I, I serve as a production manager at a church as well and have been in the worship ministry leader position as well, but my question for you guys is what what makes leadership so important for this field? Like, let's talk about the church role. We're not talking about kind of pro audio engineer or, you know, doing live event kind of things. We're talking about the church environment or the church, you know, ecosystem and why is leadership important for a worship pastor tech leader role that you would find? Why do you think that sticks out to you guys or things come to mind there? I like that you differentiated the pro audio role from like a church ministry position role. Cause I have done the pro audio thing and you don't, you can kind of be a lone wolf in that. Like you don't always have a team with you, or if you're working with a team, everyone's contracted. Mm-hmm. Um, in this role, you are a pastor. Yeah, you're not just like you're getting a 1099, and once you're done, the gig's over and whatever. But here, it's like people are depending on you; they're looking to you for you know pastoral care. Yeah, and they're not paid to listen to you. Yeah, if you're mostly a volunteer team, right? Because and the other piece of that is that you're really, I think, churches unless you're talking about a, a larger, much larger church that's really specifically hiring a full-time video director or a full-time front of house tech director position, I think churches are actually just hiring leaders, mm-hmm. right? Or they, yep. they should be hiring leaders because you are overseeing 
volunteer teams or, um, you know, people who again, aren't, aren't paid to listen to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, I think there's a piece of that that can be missed a lot of times in, in our role, because I don't know for you guys, but you know, the, the technology portion of our job and kind of the Sunday to Sunday week in and week out piece can get really, I can get really focused in on just the execution piece, you yeah. know, just the do, getting the good results. And I, I often have to remind myself to like step back and think, why am I doing what I do? And so part of this conversation is like, what do you guys think of a vision for the tech ministry is, you know, beyond, I think that execution point, because obviously I think all of us would agree there's, there is an agreement that you want to get good results. You want to produce a, a non-distracting environment for people to engage in worship during during your church gatherings. But you know, beyond beyond that, what what would a vision you know for you could use South Fellowship as an example, or just in general, what do you guys think of when it comes to casting vision for that that role or that ministry? Yeah, when I well, when I reflect on even before getting specific about our church, but the big the greater topic of leader. When I can, if I consider someone having kind of leadership skills or not, um, this is kind of how I process or I, I analyze that. Like leaders, just make things happen, mm-hmm. right? So sometimes that is, it's on a few different levels. It is, you are, like, you got to lead yourself. You've got to, you've got to lead, lead things in your department or whatever area that you're responsible over, and then you can lead others. So it's like, you know, and all three of those things kind of. To me, it's kind of a almost the maturing of uh, of a leader. Is like you really can't start with leading anything until you lead yourself. Right. You know, um, lead yourself to be healthy, be a learner. You know, take your skills to the next level. Then lead your area. Be competent at whatever area you're supposed to be in. If it's if it's worship, tech. You know, be competent in those areas. And then once you're competent. Um, you can then go ahead and also train others to be competent in that yeah. area and show them how to lead themselves. And, and I think it's so important in the church. There's so much that has to get done. Um, so much has to happen, whether you're talking from a overarching mission vision of your church to make disciples. And that breaks down into the practical activities from a week to week. There's just a lot that has to get done and we need leaders because leaders are the ones who get things done, you mm-hmm. know, and not that you do everything yourself, but you're the catalyst who's going to stir things up and, and start get the ball rolling. Yeah. And then what's cool is when you get the ball rolling, it can then it can start kind of rolling itself. And yeah. then you're you're kind of a little bit more hands off. So I mean that's where when I think about worship and tech ministry, that's why it's so important is that a lot of churches need quite a bit of work in these areas. You know, you we can always, you know, all of us can always be improving the way we were curating a worship experience for our congregation or updating technology for the times for like live streaming and stuff. It's just a lot of stuff that gets done and senior pastors don't have time to get this stuff done because they're busy doing all their things they have to lead. So they're like, Hey, let's put someone in place. Who's going to be responsible of this. Who's going to take ownership and lead it so that as a senior pastor, they're not constantly having to push and micromanage Mm -hmm. these areas. So you're, you're going to be way more attractive, especially if you're trying to get hired at a church, like if you display those leadership uh, skills of taking initiative, having vision, and then also putting action to your vision, and then being willing to to work with people, yeah, like that's it. Like yep. who can like all of the technical, like how to mix, how to sing, how to lead songs, how to run tracks, how to run a camera. Like you can learn that so quickly, especially if you join our program. That's the easy stuff to that's teach. Right. What's harder to yep. teach is just like to get you know, people to like get off their bums and, and, and get to work yeah. and lead. Well, and I think the people too get can get stuck. I think, especially I'm thinking as I was reflecting on kind of this topic, like I'm thinking about the guys who this, these past 18 months or so were, they had a background in it and their church hired them 20 hours a week to oversee their tech, mm. you know? And it's, and it's like, I, I thought to myself, if I were in their shoes, I would feel so much I would feel so much overwhelm to not only allocate my time, but I think you get so stuck in the weeds of, okay, now we have things, let's say your church has gotten things up and running and things are running pretty smoothly. Like what's the next step after you've, you know, gotten the infrastructure in place and you've got a volunteer team kind of semi-functioning and you've got rhythms and your, your broadcast or your services are pretty, you know, 
repeating each and every week. They're pretty dependable, right? Yeah. What's the next step? Like what, what should you be thinking of? What should be focusing your sights on? I think you said, you know, something about really, you know, making things happen. So like, what's that next thing that you would think needs to happen if, if a church has systems in place, things are running pretty well, you know? Well, that's us right now. I yeah. saw Phil. I mean, we did a lot of overhauling of systems in the past year since we've been here. And now we're at a place where we've got, we've, we do have the willing people and we're just training them, giving mm -hmm. more, giving them more reps, whether it's a new sound person we're training, um, uh, or getting someone on broadcast audio. A lot of our other roles are pretty straightforward, like running pro presenter, yep. video switching, like that you can train someone in about 10 minutes, what they mm -hmm. need to do, but especially mix engineering. That's one of the most, uh, intense skills for someone to to learn and get better at right for us it's it's kind of like i haven't really found other than yeah you teach them the the basic understanding and knowledge of skill set of like how mixing works and how to do it but then to me it's like you just got to give them reps and you got to give them continued feedback on what you're hearing and what needs to be fixed so that's for us i mean yeah, yeah. i feel like when i'm thinking about like <clears throat> these different levels of leadership like we are at the step now where we're able to kind of focus on, okay, we got the systems built. Mm -hmm. Now we can keep, and we're already training people, but like we, we could probably press into that even more um, for whoever's willing to do it at our church. Yeah, we've given them access to um, our courses. And so we're mm -hmm. going to be checking in on them, like, hey, how's the courses going? What are you stuck on? And I think something that we could do next is just not be needed. Like, right. the, yep. like I think the best leaders replace themselves and, you yep. know, continue to, because we're not going to be here forever, you right. know what I mean? And so I don't mean that like we're, we're going to leave this church, but just like we're going to die someday and there's going to be people that need to have the skills and knowledge that we've learned and we need to pass that on to yeah. others so that yeah. they can pass it on to others. Yeah, I think like I, I was chatting with our staff this past week and one of the things that they cued me into was that, you know, um, for our services, we have we have had a producer role before, right? Somebody who's overseeing kind of more the details, air traffic control, if you will. They're not necessarily running one particular, um, you know, tool, but they're overseeing all the people who are calling cues sometimes, kind of the liaison between the staff members. And for the longest time, that has only ever been one person. Mm -hmm. And so, and I thought to myself, well, I, what happens when that one person wants to go on a vacation or, you know, maybe they're not at the church anymore. Right now they're not at the church anymore. So mm. they've, they've said like, well, nobody really knows how to be a producer because the, that previous staff member was the only one who ever scheduled themselves in that role. And like you just said, like you're not at the church forever, you know? And even if your passion is to be at the church forever, you want to, I think, resource them well for the day that you might not be right. Mm. Set up systems and set up, you know, equip your team so that you, not just for growing a big volunteer team, but you're essentially kind of getting like years in the reserve of training and equipping your volunteers so that in the future, if something were to happen or transition were to happen, there's more people that know how to do what you do for Sunday to Sunday services. Yeah. And it's common in church culture to have people put so much of their identity in whatever role they've been given, you mm -hmm. know, maybe they've been doing it for a long, long time. It's great. You're grateful for that, but it's unhealthy when it gets to the point where other people can't learn that role. Right. From practical standpoints of who's going to do that when someone's gone. And then also just like, how else could, you know, you be serving in the church other than doing that same role every single Sunday. Maybe there's other areas you can help on, help out with. We can put someone else in there and it kind of does mitigate risk from a right. simple organizational standpoint. Um, yeah, it's great. It's great to have like the super volunteers who are always there, but I think you have to diversify what their roles look like so that you're not just, you know, left with, with, with nobody to fill something, especially if it's a really important role. Um, and for can, their protection too. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. as, as much as, you know, you want to love someone in their heart for wanting to serve every single Sunday, it's just not healthy for them and it's not healthy for the rest of your yep. ministry. And I think sometimes people get stuck in like, oh, I have this sound engineer or this lead guitarist or whoever that like they want to be here every Sunday. That's awesome. I'm just going to count on them being here every single Sunday. But what happens when their kid is sick and they feel like they have to be there yep. and you are counting on them and yeah. But you have these conversations with them and explain to them 
where you're, you know, where you're trying to take things. Cause I, I think I've, I've been in those scenarios before multiple times, just trying to help like people who have been around for a long time doing the same job all the time, but there, it's like one, one person deep in that yeah. role and that's a problem, but explaining to them, don't just like, cause they will, again, I think it's like so much identity gets wrapped up in whatever that role or responsibility is. And then if you don't communicate why you're doing what you're doing, how it's a bigger win for the whole team and the church, then they could get upset. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you want, you want a little bit of this. I, I would say a large portion of that vision is discipleship oriented. Like you're trying to remind your team that their identity is in Christ and not in yeah. their position on the team. Because yeah. if they do serve every week, that that line gets blurrier and blurrier for mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. they find their purpose. And we all know that if those things get misaligned, that that's just a recipe for disaster and unhealth. And um, and it's not what the Lord wants for our lives. And it's the opposite of what your church is hopefully teaching. And so you do, you want to really put your money where your mouth is. And my, my words are always like, God doesn't need you to make his work happen on Sunday morning. And if, if that means that you're taking a week off so that you can sit with your family and not be running lyrics, like we will find somebody to my job. My whole job is to make sure that lyrics get executed. Right. And Mm -hmm. so we'll be, we will be okay. You Mm -hmm. know, you need to take time where you're not serving each and every week in a row. And, um, so that that line doesn't become so blurry that it's confusing. Yeah, we get that. Adam and I are fortunate to get that regularly here now that we're, we alternate weeks that we serve. We alternate once a month when we lead worship. Um, so it's, it's very nice for the first time to be able to just show up to church with my family. I haven't done that in ever. I mean, that changes the game for you with your kids. Like, cause dad is with, you know, he's, he's with you when you do drop off or sitting next to your wife. Like it's, it's a game changer whether you have a family or not to be able to sit with your community mm-hmm. and you know just kind of again we, Sabbath like you rest you refuel you yep. send another preach word and I mean it's there's a reason for it right yeah at this point though I think it's actually more stressful trying to get the kids to church than it is to, <laughs> that's right to lead worship <laughs> a way simpler process to lead a worship service than getting little little human beings yeah. to cooperate but. <laughs> So in, in this kind of conversation, I mean, as, as we think through, you know, next steps for folks, I mean, any, anything practical for you guys that you would encourage people listening and who are maybe have been stuck in the weeds of just kind of making services happen and haven't kind of looked up for the past year, you know, anything that you would maybe encourage them to take practical steps to work toward this mindset and kind of this position of health in their ministry? I think the first step is to have systems that work. Yeah. Because if you don't have systems that work, then you can't even look up from it. Right. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that too, because the f- the funny thing is somebody might be really attached to a system, but it takes them 30, 45, an hour to train somebody on it. Like, is that a good system? You know, like you said, it normally takes somebody about 10 minutes to learn video directing. Like mm-hmm. it's not... It's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. The system should be pretty streamlined. So if your system is taking longer to to describe to somebody, I I would say minus front of house engineering, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you probably, you probably don't have a streamlined system in place. Right. Or if you don't have it documented, if you don't have any standing operating procedures or like even just a method for training, if you just show up and say, well, I've got all this information in my brain, I should be able to figure out how to train someone on how to do it. Then you're wasting a lot of time yeah. and brain energy yourself there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, again, I always come back to like, you got to lead yourself to get competent in these areas to like, again, you don't have to be the expert of expert at all things. Cause other people will, you know, hopefully take ownership and become better experts at things, the, whatever it is in your ministry. But like, you got to be competent enough to get the systems in place, be able to onboard other people. Um, and, and yeah, just have something that's, that's functioning. And then, then you can successfully lead others. Yeah. So I, I, again, I, I've seen this in my worship ministries. I've seen this now in church front where even church front was something that I did everything myself for the first two years, like getting this thing off the ground. And then slowly it's come to a place where now I, you know, very important, very important things are done for church front every single day that don't quite require me. I still do things that are, I'd yeah. like to do and still important, but, um, but it took like in my own journey that the, the, um, 
taking that time to, to really dig in and, and, and kind of assess my own situation of what I know, what I don't know how to do and, you know, and just learn, make it happen. And I always go back to the most practical thing. The, the best model is five levels of leadership by John Maxwell. Mm -hmm. It's a cheesy, simple little leadership book, but it's, it's true the way those levels are set up. Um, you know, a lot of worship leaders and tech directors out there are trying to lead just based off of their position or their title. Yeah. And that's going to get you barely anywhere. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, the relationship, that's what you're missing. The relationship's the next one. Performance is the next one. And then um, leadership development and something about, like, eventually the pinnacle of it, the level five is like, you are a leader who makes more leaders or yeah. something like that, right? But before you get there, you got to work on like being you know, relational and also being productive in your own role. So yeah. look, read that book. That's my practical thing is because you can easily pick that book up, read through it um, and just kind of s assess where, where you are in that journey and act yeah. accordingly. Yep. And just get some accountability. Like my, my thing is I don't think anybody in ministry should ever be in isolation. You know, if you don't have a, a tech director in your community, your neighborhood, some other neighboring church that you can just, grab coffee with once a week or something or once a month even would be sufficient. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. just take some time to step out of your context for a second, take a deep breath and, and really regain your focus on what you're actually trying to do. Cause I know a lot of weeks it can feel like the most important thing to do is to dial in your snare drum. And it's like, that's just not, you know, it's like, man, your mix might not have been great, but yeah. is that the thing that should occupy your hours during the week? That's a good that, we've been talking about this stuff a lot lately. Yeah. I feel like just discerning your own, you know, everything in life, running an organization or business is, is time and capital allocation, mm -hmm. right? And, and you have to have that mindset, even as a ministry volunteer leader, how am I usually, most of the time there's not much capital involved. So right. we talk about your time <laughs> allocation and really like, what are the, what's the important stuff that's going to get you the 80% of the results that you got to keep important? Like, uh, reaching out to people in your church to see if they want to serve. Like mm -hmm. that's going to get you the best results, right? But mm -hmm. that's not the sexy stuff. The sexy right. stuff is tuning in your snare drum so it sounds awesome, like the elevation drummer or whatever, right? right? We all geek out over that stuff. Yeah. But it's like that's that's going to get you the that that's that's going to get you the twenty percent results. Mm -hmm. That's not a priority right now. So. Yeah, I I would just say you know get get some some outside feedback from people who you trust and you respect in, in your field that can help you stay kind of grounded in that and that can support you in those efforts. Like if you're, if your mix is terrible, you should improve your mix, do the things that get it to be non-distracting in your services. And, but you know, help have somebody kind of keep you grounded in the process so you don't get lost in it. Cause it, for me, I can look back and say, my gosh, I, I got lost in that, that space. And it, it took me a while to say, yeah, my 80% of results is not coming out of this time. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm really losing some of that like real ministry work that I should be focusing on. Because what happens is when you also get the 80% taken care of now, and then you'll get other people in place, and then that'll free you up to focus on those geeky, mm -hmm. fun projects that you always want yeah. to do. And you don't lose that productivity because yep. you've replicated your yourself, right? Yep. yep. Yeah, but I think if you don't get to the point where you can self-assess and realize, oh, here are where things are at. This is what needs attention. These are the things that get, are going to re produce results for that specific thing. You might just think like, oh, this thing came up. That seems urgent and important. Or, you know, it'd be fun to dial in the snare drum or to do this or that. But like being able to take time to step back and reflect or you have some accountability yeah. and do it with someone else is is pretty important. How would you guys encourage somebody to allocate their time. Like with, if you're, if you're thinking about, um, practical tips about, you know, let's say it always comes back to a calendar for me of like yep. knowing what my work week looks like and my family rhythms look like and those kind of things. But how, what are some, maybe some wins that you guys have had in terms of, you know, how you have discerned where to spend your time mm -hmm. as you look, are you guys week long perspective where you kind of look over the five, six days of the week, or are you guys kind of day of like, how do you guys handle kind of planning out that time allocation? We kind of try to start with long-term goal setting like we we did for church front first week of the year. I probably yeah. should have done done that before the first week of the year. I'm I'm getting better at thinking farther ahead, but I'm still more stuck in the near term just cuz I like I like the flexibility and adaptability, yeah. but 
yeah, longer goals, maybe set like quarter goals. And yeah. like, I don't know, there's so many books out there on goal setting and how to how to do that. Like, I think you just got to look up. I think Michael Hyatt's got a lot of good stuff. Um, there's like the smart goals thing. Yeah. I don't know, find a system that works for you. But but I also like to keep things simple. Like, yeah. that's what I'm, the, even the bigger that church front gets and even with our worship ministry stuff, like, we just could keep things simple, keep the main thing, the main thing. Don't get, you know, shiny object syndrome and get distracted all the time. Just because someone brings a good idea, doesn't mean you should do it. Like there's a lot of great ideas out there, but like when you start to consider if I do that good idea, it's going to detract us from everything else and it's going to be a disaster. Yeah. Software updates. That's what that's referring to. Just because it's a good idea doesn't mean you have to do it. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Stuff like that. Or if someone's like, hey, we should do a a weekly worship and prayer night every single week, right? But like, I'm the type, I'm the very pragmatic, realistic type of like, okay, who's going to run sound for that event? Who's going to, like, who's going to lead it? Like, just all that stuff where we have to be more pragmatic because sometimes people go about ministry feeling like we have infinite amount of time and we don't. Nope. So we have to be very wise in discerning how it's allocated. So, I mean, that's, that's, you know, kind of the longer term, bigger strategy. And then I'd say shorter term, um, for me, I just, uh, yeah, I use my calendar and I, I use a sauna and I block out my times. I know my product, my productive creative rhythm. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's like mornings before lunch. That's my creative time. I don't take any meetings before that time or anything like that. So that's usually when I'm making YouTube videos or TikToks or scripting things or, you know, just deeper work. And then this time of day, like it's after lunch, we had lunch together and now we're doing kind of more of a meeting slash podcast recording. And then usually I leave the second half of my afternoon all for just more, just kind of like research, but light research. Like I kind of, it's like more, it's it's like restful for me and flexible. And then that's, so that's how I stay productive. But weren't you guys talking about the um, At Your Best book by Carrie Newhoff? Yeah. That's pretty good. Yep. Just yeah. show like how to manage your time. And- yeah, and it's it's a lot of what you just said where like right now I'm doing my kind of energy tracking where I'm looking through and realizing I, I have a pretty similar rhythm where, you know, from when I wake up until, you know, it takes a couple hours to like really get my brain yeah. into a space where I'm like ready to do deep work. And then you know, after lunch, kind of a lull. So it's a good time to knock out just emails mm-hmm. or, you know, other kind of more repetitive, less deep work tasks. Um, so, I mean, that's that's a huge part of what I've been learning lately. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in, in general, I'd say too, outside of the, the calendar, or I guess within the calendar, looking ahead a year and then realizing, okay, if I want to reach this goal by this quarter, this means I need to do X every single week. Right. And that means I need to do X every single day. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Just reverse engineer it down to the day, basically. Yep. Yeah. You're not going to wake up in 12 months from now and have your goals achieved if you haven't reverse engineered those strategic steps to get there. Yeah. So it's, and it, you know, part of we we can get, again, we can get really nerdy about all these goal settings and things like that. But what I, what I hope that our listeners here, and and hopefully if if you're just, again, I'm thinking of the people who have probably recently stepped into some sort of a tech leadership role or worship leadership role communications overseeing these broadcast systems and also just churches went through a lot of transition last year. So Mm -hmm. I'm thinking like these people are probably looking for resources and helpful, you know, tips and tricks. I'm, I'm hopeful that even if it's just, I didn't know to think about like a creative time or a really productive, you know, deep work time. Like there are so many resources to help you hone in those areas at Your Best is a new book that came out a couple months, I feel like a couple months ago, maybe, yeah. you know, this past year or something like that. And it's it's a great, easy read, but it, it just is helping you focus on when you're doing your best work, right? And helping mm-hmm. assess that. Um, one of the things I, I would say is along the lines of goal setting and, you know, getting all your needed work done during the week, other thing I would say is you need to find some margin somewhere, you know, because... Mm-hmm. I think, and you even said, you know, I do some light research because it's, it's kind of restful. It's, it's yeah. enjoying, you know, I can enjoy that process. Um, like going to the coffee shop, reading a yeah. book, reading articles. Um, yeah. Like stuff that's or, only yeah. because you have some sort of margin yeah. time that you can step in there. Like last, yeah. last night was one of the first nights I'm, I'm trying this thing where like five o'clock hits and I turn off my phone for at least the next three hours. Cause yeah. that's kids are, we're kind of in the bedtime routine. And you can turn your phone off. Like you I can turn your about phone that. off. Yeah. 
And I, I've just found that like I can be way more present, active, involved in conversation in my home if, if I'm just, my phone's like not even an option. So I just, I'm turning it off for a couple hours a night until we get done with the bedtime routine. But like last night I felt like, man, I don't really want to turn it back on. So I just watched a movie. Nice. And it was the first time I'd watched a movie on a weeknight in, I can't tell you how long, but it was yeah. for me, I was like, I had a lot of rest in that moment. And it was mm-hmm. a, you know, an hour and a half not looking at your phone or not doing anything else besides just like getting pulled into a story is for me, that was one of those moments where I was like, that was helpful for my week. I'm, yep. I'm recharged, you know, energized in a new way. And so find, find margin some way, shape or form, whether it's early morning, mid afternoon, evening, something that gives you that, that yep. moment of rest. So. This, yeah. Cause there's, there's times where like when you, I'm glad that the there's books like at your best coming out and there's books about flow and all that. I think it's kind of the trend these days with the workplace is that it's less about, you know, you got to grind from 8, 8 a.m. To, to, to 5 p.m. or whatever, right. five, your typical eight hour day. Um, maybe the nature of some jobs is like that, but especially for worship and tech, it, it is kind of a, it is a creative job. Yeah. And there's going to be times where like, if you optimize your energy levels, um, the right way you can get done in a two hour time span more, more in one, two hour time span of great creative flow and energy and focus than what most people get done in eight hours yep. during the whole day. Exactly. Um, so I don't know, even if you're, so especially if you're listening to this and you, you, you manage others or, you know, your, maybe your senior pastor, like hopefully that kind of helps you understand creative work a little bit better. And, but what's nice is like, there's still obviously a lot that, that can always get done. So it's like if we, we usually reserve for the late afternoon, sometimes it can also be like, I see your calendar today, Adam was like clean backstage, right? Because yeah. we have to we have to organize our backstage, yep. but that does not take intense creative brain power from him. No. Yep. And yeah. you can kind of tune out, you know, you yeah, can listen, yeah, listen to a to podcast or, or podcast yeah. and just listen get, to the church front podcast. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, you subscribed yet? Yeah, I am. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. It's good to have those. Like, even when you're not feeling like you're doing thought-provoking work, you're still being productive in some. Because I know for me, if I try to do a, a organizational project like that in the morning, I'll overthink it because my mind mm-hmm. is more in a thought kind of posture. I'm, I'm, I should be creating, building systems, pouring into volunteers, like those things in the morning, and that afternoon slot should really be like handwork. You know, something yeah. where I'm editing video, editing our YouTube, yeah. you know, channel or some, something like that, where it's more logistical. Here's an idea. Here, get your list, especially for the lower, you know, brain power times a day, get a list, uh, go into planning center, whatever your church is used as a people management software, make sure you get your passwords from permission. I think they'd be fine, but like go down the list, start calling people. Cause you probably have their phone numbers and just be like, Hey, have you ever thought about serving on the worship or tech team at our church? <laughs> Literally, like if you spent like in just one hour a week doing that every week, you yeah. would never run out of people for your position. Yep. But 99% of worship and tech leaders out there won't be willing to do that. No. To literally pick up a phone and call. It's like no pressure, but like, just like, I don't know, it's just a novel idea. Yeah. Right? That's, I probably <laughs> would have to do that in the morning because my afternoon slots are safe for when I don't have to talk to people. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And you can hear, I mean, listeners hopefully can hear too, that there's a lot of different ways and there's not a right way. So you got to find the way that feels good to you, that works well for you and that you start seeing those results increase, you know, and it won't, I, I just promise you, it's not going to happen in a week. It's not going to happen. You probably won't find your true rhythm for at least a couple months of dedicated, committed trial and error and, and kind of reflective, you know, you got to step back and say, did that work for me? Did that not work for me? Yeah. I mean, I'm still finding that out and I've been in ministry work for over a decade. So you feel like I should have this honed in by now, Mm -hmm. but I I feel like I'm still learning like, Oh, pre-lunch, I'm actually hitting my post-lunch lull a little bit early. You know, it's like finding those things. You just learn new things about yourself all the time. It changes with seasons of life. So find something that works for you, do some reflective assessment, you know, get some input from others and it's, it's important stuff. So, well guys, I mean, that's a, that's a great conversation about really leadership kind of vision setting leadership hacks Um, for worship ministry leaders. That's what we should title it. (laughs) I think that's, I think it's going to be people to click and listen. Yeah. Well, 
that was it. Well, thanks for joining, for listening in whatever platform you're on or for, for watching the video. And we're, we're hopeful that just giving you something to, to chew on as you're hopefully doing your organizing backstage, you know, and, uh, but if you want more resources like this, you can always subscribe to this podcast and check out more of our episodes coming your way and previous episodes we've done on similar topics. You can also, uh, visit churchfront.com for blogs, videos, courses, um, just other free resources to grow you and grow your ministry. And we, we kind of approach this as a holistic you know, vision for these roles. And so we, we have a full program where we work with worship leaders and tech directors all over the globe where they'll come into our program. And we, we really talk about not only the technical aspects of their job, but we dive into some of this time allocation, goal setting, you know, kind of holistic health piece as a leader. So mm -hmm. if you're interested in that, you can always jump on a free strategy session with one of our coaches at worshipministryschool.com. We'll get you started and uh, we'd love to chat with you, hear more about your ministry and things you're trying to accomplish. So thanks for joining us today, Adam and Jake. We'll catch you guys next time.